Good morning and welcome to our adult forum. It is the kickoff and it is fun to gather together again, isn't it? We know we still will have some precautions, but at least we can still gather together. Prior to the pandemic, um, we were getting ready to celebrate our 150th anniversary at Zion Lutheran Church and we were doing so many great activities. And one of the things that we were doing was a suggestion um, to Pastor Elaine Sapala to do various interviews with folks as we um, um, prepare to celebrate our history and so to have these oral histories that we can uh, look back on and hear these great stories. And so I want to thank those who did the interviews for um, Colleen Nelson and Sylvia Goldman, Doug Jones, and the late Marlene Colvin. Um, she did her interviews in the early um, early stages of her illness, and so we do dearly miss Marlene and the good things that she did, but she gave us these gems. I also want to thank our Director of Youth and Young Adult Ministries, and that is Josh, for he did all of the filming and the initial editing, and so thank I really thank him for doing this. During our times together, we have two times together that we will hear some great stories from people like Pastor Rube Grayler, Pastor Leanne Rock, Chet Tolleston, Greg Bergeron, Karen Carlson, Marge Anderson, Anderson, Emily Johnson, and Pastor Mark T.D. as we celebrate Zion's history, but also Zion moving forward in faith. Now, initially, there were over eight hours of interviews and like I said, wonderful stories, but unfortunately, I had to edit it down to just two 45-minute segments for us as we um, come together. But it is uh, wonderful face stories and uh, an opportunity, again, to catch a glimpse of Zion's history, but also to celebrate Zion's um, future. So let's enjoy these great interviews. Today, it is my honor to visit with Pastor Leanne Rock, who served at Zion from pa as a pastor uh, from, uh, well, from 1984 through 2004, but I will let her tell you more about that. And the interview is being conducted by Marlene Colvin on December 4th, 2019. Pastor Rock, we at Zion Lutheran have been blessed with your presence and your ministry among us. Thank you for allowing us to be here today. So as we began, I'm just going to ask you to tell about when you first became a member of Zion and what attracted you to Zion. Yes, I'd be happy to do that and thank you. I love, I love being asked to do this. It just, Zion is such an important focus in my life. But actually, I was not attracted to Zion. <clears throat> we were a young couple living out in the sticks in Anoka County. And one day I received a phone call from the pastor who had baptized, confirmed, and married me. And he said, his name was Leonard Kendall. And he said, <clears throat> Leanne, I am going out to Zion Lutheran Church in Anoka. And, I, and he named the day. And he said, I am going to be installing a new pastor to Zion Church. His name is William Heilengren. And I'm telling you, you now and your family should join Zion Church in Anoka. We'd been attending worship in other places closer to where we lived. So we were there. And we met Pastor Heilengren. And on, it was on that day, or maybe a Sunday or two in between, Pastor Heilengren and his family my husband Bill and I and our family, and I think there were five or six other families who joined the church on the same, in the same worship service. So that was in about 1957, I would say. 57, yes. yeah. Then you, was Zion your first call? Yes. So how many years were you, did, were you doing ministry at Zion in that first you talked about having kind of two different calls. Yes, inside. I had two different calls. Well, I can't say exactly, um, but I started in 1984, and I was, you know, I, I, my one of my prayers would be, I would ask God, 
please let me be a pastor for as long as it took me to get to seminary. <laughs> I just want five years. <laughs> but it, my calls were both longer than that. And then we, my husband and I had retired. Uh, so, and, and then in 1957, uh, very tragically, our oldest son died unexpectedly from a massive hemorrhage, a I stroke. remember that. Yes. And so uh, a few days after his funeral, my bishop called and said, your grief belongs with us. He said, you're going back to work. So Zion called me back. What stands out to you about your both your membership and your ministry at Zion? What would be some favorite memories of that time? Well, the memories are uh, nostalgic, of course. At Zion, when Bill and I first, with our family, joined the church, we were a very quiet church. We worshiped quietly. Only the pastor maybe particip was led the worship, of, and his, his messages to us were always powerful and beautifully delivered. Our singing was very quiet and, and we were mostly a very quiet church. We came into the church quietly. We left the church quietly. But that started to change. And very soon after, after that, we, were, we had young interns that would come to serve Zion. And one of them said to us one Sunday, I'm sure that I'm in the right place because I, this Zion Lutheran Church, he said, because nobody here jumps up and down in excitement. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but he made that change. And now, you know, through the years, my goodness, from, from we love the, the wonderful old hymns, and that's the only thing that was presented for music. Well, as I look at how that has evolved, and now we do a lot of jumping up and down, <laughs> and now we have a lot of kinds of different kinds of music, and we enjoy it all, and we do get excited. <laughs> <laughs> the excitement is at a high level. <laughs> And we do participate, not just certain jobs for certain people. That part has gone forever. And now we are, are a participating church. We are a church without walls in the sense that we serve not just our neighborhood and our own people, but we serve in a, with a world view. And that has been a thrilling to be a part of in, at Zion. I, my next question was going to be, what was the, what it was the most rewarding, um, what was most rewarding about your time at Zion? And it, I know you said what, it's been rewarding yes, to see it, some of these changes. Um, there and are the mentorship that I received, the friendship and the mentorship from my first pastor, Pastor Highland Grilla. I He opened doors quietly for so many changes in the church. And being a woman was not a favorite thing to be at any church in those years. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of division in the thinking about that. It was like he just looked past that and didn't mention it, but put me in place. And that was happening when I started, that was happening universally, or I should say within our nation, um, in many, many states. And he, he just, uh, he just said, yes, this, this is the way it is, you know. And so my rewards were just being there, being a part of that, just being a part. Well, that was a rewarding part for Zion, too, so it goes, goes well, both ways. 
What, what would you like Zion members from the past or present and future to know about Zion in general? To know about Zion? I think that we should know our history. <clears throat> I, uh, one of the things I think about is the level of, or the involvement of our people. I, I'm pleased to see that when, uh, with our children, I would just like to say, with our children, that without losing the awe factor of being in church, let's keep on educating them and welcoming them to be comfortable in places like standing on the altar level, being a part of a worship service, being a part of the planning, a part of Everything that we do really belongs not only to us as adults, but it belongs to with our precious children. And with, <clears throat> with so many of them, it's a little bit intimidating, especially, no, you're in church. <laughs> no, let's be comfortable in church because we will you belong here. You belong here. As we look at Zion's future, what is something that you think is important for Zion's future? Ah, the invitation. The church, this is one thing I learned and watched with Pastor Heinegren too. The church has one power in this world one power, and that power is to invite. We talked about that in the interview with Pastor Heilengren's daughter, mm -hmm. Karen Carlson, and how he, how much time and energy and work he put into that invitation to yes, oh yes, to people. Very much so. Mm -hmm. Are there other memories or other? important things you would like to share with? Oh, I, I am just so eternally grateful to my Zion Lutheran Church. Zion, I've been at many churches as interim pastor, as visiting, and now, of course, uh, when you retire as a pastor in our synod, which is a very wise rule, or it's an unspoken rule, really, that when you retire as pastor, you leave that congregation and you will establish yourself in a, in a different church. And so I have been led to Faith Lutheran and Coon Rapids, and it's, it's a, a exciting, wonderful place to be. But Zion Lutheran remains the church of my heart. Well, Always. because you... You live in the community of Zion. You raised your family in the community yes. of Zion. Yes. So I think the unusual part of this is not only were you a community member and a member of Zion, but you were a pastor at Zion. Then you were, went away for a bit. You came back. You were a pastor at Zion again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You still live in the community. Oh, yes. So um, mm -hmm. you are a face of Zion. Yes, yes. Well, I think our time has come to an end, unless there is anything else that well, you want to share. Well, I just thank you. I'm, I'm so honored that I can be a part of this. Thank Zion you. Lutheran Church in Oka, Minnesota, as we celebrate 150 years forward in faith. Today, it is my honor to visit with Karen Carlson, daughter of Pastor William Heilengren, who served Zion as pastor from 1956 until 1988. Zion was blessed with your dad's ministry. Thank you for being here today, Karen. Well, I know what brought him to Zion. Uh, my dad was a builder, and he could see opportunity here. It was a very, very fast-growing area, and uh, he, he knew what he could accomplish, and he knew it was the right uh, spot for him. And when he came, 
there were 850 adult members, and when he finished his ministry, there were 8,500 adult members. Mission accomplished. I would say so. Wow. Very good. What stands out to you about your dad and his ministry at Zion, and what are some favorite memories you would have? Well, my father was a workaholic. He worked seven days a week. He worked every evening, either at a meeting or his favorite thing was out calling on prospective members. I rarely saw him, but he was always home with our family for dinner. And he had a um, box in his car with index cards. And they were all the people that he either had called on or was going to call on. And in all the times he went to people's homes, he says that he was never, ever turned down. And sometimes if they were a little leery, he would say, well, I sell uh, life insurance. <laughs> oh, they said, we don't, we don't need any uh, life insurance. Oh, yes, he said, but this is eternal life insurance. So he was very um, funny and, and very clever uh, in his ways. But just getting them to church wasn't all he wanted to do. He always, he knew if they had children, he knew how old they were. And he wanted to tell them about the different programs that Zion offered. Really programs for everyone and very good music. I don't think he told them that he was a good preacher. <laughs> he could have, but I'm sure he did not. But when they came, um, they usually came back. He had a great voice, wonderful poetry. And um, my favorite thing that he ever said from the pulpit was one Easter when he said, um, it's not Christians who have to define Easter. It's Easter that defines Christians, which is right to the point. Right. Well, I, the, his, his, when you mentioned his sermons, his sermons were always good, and he was. He did use poetry a lot. A lot. And, I mean, I, I remember that very much, and uh, sense of humor, lots of good laughs, but also he really got to the point, and there was always a serious point mm -hmm. in the sermon, too. And he was also very um, ecumenical. You know, in those days, um, the Catholics were the Catholics, the Lutherans were the Lutherans, the Baptists over here, and he made a very good relationship with the father at St. Stephen's, and he was out and about in the neighborhood, in the town. Everyone knew who Pastor Heilengren was, and he went to the football games. Well, and uh, say, hockey games, football games, yeah, concerts. Everything. I he can was still there. see him walking around that track with his hat on, you know, the, <laughs> that they used to wear, those hats. And everyone knew who he was. Yeah. And once um, a gentleman, his name was John Johansson, was there with his grandson, Steve Johansson. <clears throat> anyway, the little kid said to the grandpa, when he saw my father, he said, Grandpa, there goes your Lord. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what everyone kind of thought. I mean, he was sort of a mystical character. And it was, everyone knew who he was. And he basically knew who they were uh, also. Yeah, and his voice, you know, he, we talked about his sermons being great, but he also, he had this, he had a, a voice that he was... He had a gift of a wonderful voice. Yes, he did. He had a wonderful voice. Yeah. And for speaking. You knew that... Not God. for singing. He couldn't <laughs> sing a note. He did, but he, but could he couldn't. But he had a wonderful uh, speaking voice. It was yes. sort of like God was right there in the pulpit. It was. You know, it was. It was, yeah. Yeah. It was a good yeah. thing that... Uh, you weren't required in those days to sing the liturgy like some people do now <laughs> because that wouldn't have gone over so well. So, well, he certainly brought 
uh, brought a lot to Zion. Um, are there any other memories or things that you would like to share with? Well, I remember that he had, uh, oh gosh, well, Ernie Wolszewski was the head usher. And uh, very often there w wasn't room for all the people to sit. So the ushers would be setting up those chairs up and down the aisle. And my father used to, that was a, such a wonderful sound to his ears, the setting up of chairs, because that meant that more people were coming. And then that transferred out to the parking lot. And that, you had to have a manager of the parking lot. I know it sounds crazy, but because you had services every hour, mm -hmm. there had to be the flow of traffic so that people could get in and out. And of course, the upstairs hallway was quite the mess oh, yes. <laughs> because people were picking up their kids from Sunday school and dropping them off. Um, and it was it, it was all wonderful. It makes makes me think about the Lenten services. You knew you had to get here early if you wanted a seat because the it would be just packed and all the there would be chairs on both ends of the rows, mm -hmm. folding chairs set up, and uh, the Lenten services I think were another um, great part of his ministry, um, and. I'll never forget three things about the Lenten service. Number one, the big lighted cross in the front. Number two, the movies, mm -hmm. because the movies were about the life of Christ. And you, you could visualize it. You saw it right there. And every week it was a different part of the life of Christ. And then uh, the third thing I remember is there is a green hill far away yeah. without a city wall. Uh, those, those three things, the, the Lenten services. Well, thank you, Karen. On behalf of the members of Zion and of the staff and our 150 years forward in faith, um, thank you for sharing memories of your dad and of his love of our God and, and of his people. Today we have the great honor of visiting with Chet Tollefson who has served Zion in many areas of ministry between the years of 1957 to present. We at Zion Lutheran have been blessed with your lasting impact, Chet, on both the areas of ministry in Zion, but also out in the community of Anoka County. Um, I, I understand that you and your late wife, Gladys, came here in 1957. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yes, we moved up here in May of 1957 and uh, bought a house right over here on Adams Street. And we went to church here at Zion that particular weekend and signed a visitor's card. But it wasn't more than about two or three days and Pastor Heilengren came to our door Talked a while, and as a result, we became members of Zion. And we've been our members here of the church ever since. One way or the other, we got involved by many different aspects. Well, tell me more about that, because yes, you have done several things here at Zion over the years. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the different areas of ministry? Well, Gladys was a good Lutheran lady, and she played the piano. Mm -hmm. So she got involved, of course, with Sunday school, playing the piano, not only playing the piano, but teaching classes. Sure. As a result, of course, I tagged along, and sooner or later I got involved with various aspects, with uh, Lutheran Brother, it was called then later becoming thrivent. Right. So I got involved with, through Steinbecker, who was the insurance agent, mm -hmm. and ended up working with Lutheran Brotherhood, various projects on behalf of the insurance company and the church around the branch. We called them branches. I guess they're still going. <laughs> and you served 
as president of the branch? I ended up serving as president for five years in branch 8274. And we did uh, various projects around the county for different churches. One lady, I remember, we, she needed a liver transplant, a lady in Ham Lake. We ended up having projects at the various churches. Some of them here at Zion were concerts. We raised uh, $10,000, and through their matching funds, she ended up getting a check for over $29,000. Oh, that's fantastic. And like you mentioned, you served on the church council more than once. Yeah, I think it was two terms I served at various times, yeah. Do you remember anything going on back when you served on the council? Decisions that were made for the church? Well, we added on, I think, one, at least once while I was on the council. We've added, of course, to the church. The original church, of course, was here when we came in 57. But then we've added on four times since that time. The first edition, did that involve Sunday school classrooms? Oh, yeah. The whole Sunday school classrooms to the north of the main church and okay. on the west wing. Uh -huh. And then, gosh, quite a few years ago, the Levi men started that group. You want to talk yes. about that? We had, and originally we had what they called the Men of Zion. And they were... That was a good group, but then, uh, I forget what year it was, but Pastor Strumman came back uh, from a meeting in Texas, and they uh, reorganized the men of Zion and to the uh, Joshua men, and uh, formed the 12 tribes. <laughs> we, uh, one of the tribes was called the Levi Men, and that's the group that I and a few other people uh, got into. Was, and uh, the part of their project then was to work with the church and pray for the Sunday school kids, children. So I'm curious if you wanted to um, talk a little bit about the start of the organization, the nonprofit organization, RISE? RISE Incorporated, yeah. We, uh, uh, Gladys and I have our, had our, our last son, our last child, was Loring. Mm -hmm. He was born in uh, 53, 1953. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was uh, handicapped, uh, mentally disabled. So he went through the school system, but he was a slow learner. So he was involved with special classes at school. And as a result, Gladys and I got involved with the Anoka County Association for Retarded Children, or it was called then, ARC. And of course, as we worked through that, that and worked with the school districts to be sure they had classes uh, established for the handicapped. Uh, we became involved there too, and of course as officers of the branch, ARC, and uh, they just worked and worked at different things. And when Loring got out of high school, not high school, well he graduated, uh, uh, got out of school when he was uh, 18, and he was uh, mentally disabled, so. But there was things he could do, so we looked into the possibility of uh, establishing a facility where these people could report to work and they'd bring work into this facility, certain things that they could do, sorting envelopes and sorting nuts and bolts and stuffing envelopes and every other thing. Sure. And it, uh, that was in 1971 we started RISE, uh, right here at the Noka County Fairgrounds to begin with. But then uh, about uh, six months later, we rented a building down Spring Lake Park, which we later purchased. And uh, that's RISE 
Incorporated's headquarters are still there in Spring Lake Park at that building, and they too have added on since that time and expanded. So there's, there's facilities all around the Twin Cities operated by Rice Incorporated for the handicapped. Now I remember talking with you earlier, and it started out with an $8,000 grant from Anoka County. Yeah, this we started with a little original grant from Anoka County. With just a handful of individuals that benefited from this. I think there was eight individuals we started with. Okay. And over this last 44 or five years, it's just grown tremendously. Right. And I'm just uh, happy that they continue to function and serve a purpose. Mm -hmm. Welcome to Zion Lutheran Church, Anoka, Minnesota, as we celebrate 150 years forward in faith. Today, I have the great honor of visiting with Pastor Rube Grayler, who served here at Zion. He's going to tell you a lot more about that in a little bit. This interview is being conducted by Sylvia Goldman, and it is January 15th, 2020. We at Zion have been blessed with what you have done, Pastor Grayler, over the years, and we are looking forward to talking with you today. We came to Zion, and thanks to Pastor Heilengren's fabulous ministry for 31 years, there was a feeling of beautiful, tender Swedish piety. <laughs> <laughs> where they still loved their pastors and they still appreciated the ministry of the congregation. They were extremely loyal to the fact that this was a place they had grown up. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, some of the things that relate to that is uh, we, th there was a 5.30 service started and there were about 25 okay. people coming to it. Well, uh, what I did is I said, well, no, that's a blue jeans service. <laughs> If you're working in the yard or the kids are running around or doing whatever, they just come as you are. And when I left, we were uh, getting close to 300 people every Saturday night. And a family came. This was unique because you'd see a, a family walk in, the grandma first, and then the mom, and then the kids, and then the sure. dad. And they probably arrived in their pickup and were wearing their <laughs> stuff from there. But anyhow, this family came through, and, and frankly, a couple of them were in tears and said, Rube, we just hate to see you leave. This has been the greatest thing that's <coughs> happened for our family. We are all so busy, we could never figure out when we could get to worship together yeah. or anything. And at the 5.30 worship work, we just agree we're all going to meet at the church at 5.30. And um, we had a standing order at Domino's Pizza at 6.30. <laughs> and it, cool. it solidified our family because we had the worship and the time together where before we were all over the map. And so, you know, that was really exciting. It, this is a community church. Yes. And, I, and then I'll finish with this on yeah. this question. Um, it not only was a community church, but it had the community leaders in it. Um, Marvel, I could start naming names who, you know, the county attorney, Bob Johnson, and sure. Art Dussel, the, the principal at the high school. I mean, the leadership of the community was also part of the leadership of this congregation. Mm -hmm. So it permeated. And that's where, for at least a couple of years, we said, a city in the heart of the church with a heart for the city. Okay. And uh, we, it was amazing. We drew people from all over. Yeah. That's a great phrase. I like that heart phrase. Um, so kind of continuing with the same idea of experiences and so forth, some favorite memories or stories? Well, you, yeah. Uh, well, we did a number of things that, that um, uh, for instance, they'd never done a Habitat for Humanity house. I've done eight of them. And so I, um, I said, well, why don't we see if there's interest in doing that? I gave, I did a pancake breakfast, and um, and we had enough people who were interested, and uh, we ended up doing three habitat houses while I was here. But uh, a, a great story is that um, a guy who had moved from southwestern Minnesota, Clayton Follett, he was in his early 70s, 
And I, I saw him there, and I visited with him, and I wanted to get to know who he was. And uh, Clayton said, well, I did some carpenter work. And I said, well, Clayton, what did you do? And he said, well, yeah, I was a carpenter. And I said, Clayton, you're going to teach me how to build a house. And on all three houses, Clayton and I worked together, and we had a ball. We told stories. We laughed. Everybody, we were kind of the show at the Habitat for Humanity House. And do outreach. Now, a quick story. I, um, I had some, some of us put together a geographic map of the membership of the congregation. And so it was like this, and there were a few, you know, here and there. But out here, over in the northwest, about uh, five miles out, was a whole pocket of Zion members. Mm. I mean, it wasn't logical. Mm -hmm. And I and so what I did is I visited with the people out there, and they'd all look at me and smile and say, Shirley Dussel. Oh. And I said, what do you mean by that? And they said, well, Shirley Dussel goes for a walk in the morning and evening. And if there was a moving truck, Shirley Dussel would come over and say, hi, glad you're moving into our neighborhood. The next day she'd bring some rolls or cookies over. And then she'd always say, you know, I belong to a really great church. And if you don't have a church home, I'd like to either pick you up or invite you to come and introduce you to some folks there. And virtually that entire neighborhood had been evangelized by the hospitality of a woman who graciously welcomed them, and they saw the living faith sure. of a person who was deeply committed. And it wasn't easy for she and Art. I mean, they lived a little ways away from the church. They didn't just walk down the street. Sure. That's what we are missing in our churches these days. So have... um, that leads me to another story. <laughs> okay. Um, we had some real building needs here, and it's a joy to walk in. Um, I have a, a lawyer friend of mine who said, you know, you can only tell where Rube Grailer was. They had a building project. <laughs> but um, so uh, it, it, we had really, we're crowded and needed just a lot of stuff. So I proposed that we do an exploration for a building. And we did. A lot of needs. And then I, what I did is I said to the congregation, this is probably going to be my last call. Um, and I'm not about to lead you in a, a three and a half million dollar building program and walk away and say, well, I hope you can pay the debt. So if we really feel that this is needed for our ministry, and if we're really serious about this, then let's put our money where our mouth is. So we had a fundraiser. Okay, we hired, he was great. Anyhow, I was up at the lake on vacation in August, and I get this call, and uh, uh, Leanne's secretary said, well, the fundraiser's here, and he says he's got to have some kind of major campaign theme, and he's got to have it by Monday. Mm. So I said, will you call <coughs> the committee members? And we, uh, they did, and we'll get together. And uh, we came together, and I said, well, there's one purpose for this meeting. We have to come up with a theme for this whole campaign. So we, we gather the building committee and, and, uh, for our campaign. I called um, uh, Karen Miller, who was on the committee, and I said, Karen, we've got this special meeting with you devotion, do devotion. She's sure. So she shows up at the meeting, and uh, she sits down, and I said, well, let's begin. We all know what we're here for, uh, and we've got to come up with a theme. And she said, um, you know, last night I spent time writing this devotional about an experience, but she said, you know, driving here, I just felt there was something I really wanted to share with the group, and it's not that, so I'm not going to use this. And she said, um, when I was a, uh, at Augustana, we had a marvelous group of people in the dorm, and they were friends and still are, but when we were seniors, we decided there should be some, we ought to do something as outreach. And so we, we talked about it, and there were seven of us, and we decided we were going to do a clown and mime ministry for Sunday school kids in Luther Lakes. 
So she said, we did, and it was really fun, and we had a good time, and we were always together and the whole thing. Well, what happened, she said, is the last few days when we were at Augustana, the people in that dorm said, will you guys do a final devotion for um, the dorm? Because we've all been here, and we're all friends, and we're close and everything. And she said, we thought, well, we've never done anything for adults, but we can do our shtick from, you know, the kids or whatever. Sure. And she said, we did. We did some clowning. We, did, we had a guy who really did great mime. And she said, we came to the end of this devotional, and everybody was really feeling close, and there were some tears. And then she said, the guy who did mime reached into his shirt and pulled out a red heart out of craft paper. And without saying a word, he began to go around tearing off a little piece and handing it to each person. And they would, you know, nonverbal. And, and she said, here's mine. And she said, you know, we get together and people will pull those out. And it was a reminder that we gave each other a piece of our heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, awesome. was, it was so powerful that we all keep talking about it and remember it. Sure. And uh, she finished and prayed, and then I said, um, I think the meeting's over. What this whole thing is about is sharing a piece of my heart. Oh, that sounds familiar. That was it. That was it. I remember that. Yeah, our meeting lasts yes. about 10 minutes, and we had an artist who said, oh, this is going to be great. I can do a lot of stuff with that. Awesome. Well, I think I'm going to just kind of wrap it up with this. Um, so if there's anything else that really stands out that you haven't told us yet and anything else that you would like to share with us, Rube, and I just want to add, since you talked about that heart story, I knew the phrase, but I don't think very many people know the origin and where it yeah. came from. So I appreciate that part of the story, sure. I just wanted to add that. So a couple other things for you to share with us as we, as we wrap it up here. Um, well, I think the, the bottom line summary is for, for Zion to be a, uh, to remember its history, to be proud of its ministry, to celebrate its ministry, to affirm its ministry, to be outreaching and, and cordial and grace, gracious and welcoming, and to realize that, that this parish has um, a great opportunity, but also a great responsibility <clears throat> to share the gospel. The joy of being here during those years and the memories of those years is just really terrific. And I thank you for inviting me to come and share. Um, uh, I could share more stories because that's what it's all about. Um, the whole thing in relationship to Jesus is about a story mm -hmm. that God couldn't figure out how to get it through our thick heads that we were really loved and saved. And so he sent, personally sent his son, uh, who showed us what it means, died and rose again, and um, it, it, that's what it's all about. Absolutely. And I thank you. Well, thank you. Um, you have blessed us. And 150 years is a very huge amount of time. But in the years that you were here, Rube Grayler, you have blessed so many people and made such a difference in our lives. So thank